Hi guys, Harry here. Welcome to Scrap Science. What we are going to be attempting to do today is building a functional chloralkali cell. Now this is a topic that's probably kind of a little bit overdone on this channel. Um, we've built three, I think, chloralkali cells in the past at some stage. Uh, this will be a little bit different though because in all those other times um, we've built chloralkali cells for a demonstration or an investigation purpose, whereas this device is going to be for the actual production uh, on an amateur scale of sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. I guess you can also use it for other alkali hydroxides as well, uh, but this device is, uh, for me, specifically going to be used to generate um, sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide especially. So I've put a lot of thought into the design of the chloralkali cell that we're going to be building and I'm thinking that the simpler the better. So what we're going to be building it out of is just regular PVC. Uh, I have a couple of 90 degree fittings here uh, with a little piece of pipe to connect them and we'll just be putting them together something like that. So what we'll have is two separate chambers for each of our electrodes. Maybe the anode would go here and the cathode would go here. Uh, we have this piece of pipe in the middle in which we will be putting a diaphragm to put between the electrodes. And as we know, as per the chloralkali process, we will fill the anode chamber with a saturated or something solution of uh, potassium chloride or sodium chloride and distilled water in the cathode chamber. If we apply current, uh, then the sodium or potassium ions will traverse through the diaphragm and form uh, sodium or potassium hydroxide in the cathode chamber, which is what we want. What I'm thinking for the diaphragm is simple as ever. Uh, we'll just be using a piece of a clay pot, clay flower pot that I got at my local hardware store. I'm aware that there are more effective and better um, diaphragms. could even make myself uh, ion exchange membrane or if I really wanted to I could buy myself some nafion membrane which is an ion exchange membrane specifically designed for this kind of process and we will cover those things in a future video but right now to me uh, nothing competes with a clay pot in terms of simplicity and how long it'll last I mean we'll never have to replace uh, the diaphragm if we use a clay pot anyway clay pot is what we're going with as always what we'll do is I take this out I'm thinking if we just kind of smash this clay pot up and then get a circular piece from the bottom uh, that fits nicely into our PVC pipe um, we will have to plug that hole with a bit of silicon probably but that will make a nice big high surface area uh, membrane I mean it's not that high surface area but it will do I think Next thing we worry about is electrodes uh, for the cathode, as I've said many times before, we can use pretty much any metal, maybe avoiding aluminium, uh, so I'll probably just end up using copper wire or something like that to generate hydrogen and the hydroxide that will be forming. For the anode, it's a bit trickier because we're generating chlorine, so we can only use platinum, MMO and graphite. There are a couple other ones that you can use, but they're very difficult to come by or make. I'm thinking we will use... Uh, an MMO anode. I have a small piece of MMO mesh here. So I'll find some way of connecting to this electrode, uh, stick that in solution, probably use some titanium. I have a little piece here to connect it up and hopefully that will do. And maybe not in this video, but later on, if we want to collect the gases coming off our cell, I mean, we'll be generating hydrogen off the cathode and chlorine off the anode, relatively pure, uh, I might add. Uh, we can use, I bought some small glass funnels that we should be able to just place over the electrodes, uh, dip them a little bit into the solution, and the gas should be able to just be taken off. Anyway, enough talk about what we're going to do. Uh, let's just go ahead and do it. First step is to get our clay pot, whack it with a hammer, and then try to chip off a few of the edges. Of course, we break our first clay pot into pieces that are not uh, really usable for our diameter of PVC so we have to break up a different clay pot a smaller one that seems to fit all right I guess um, that'll do 
we silicon that in and make sure to silicon up that little hole in the center too. But while that's drying, uh, we might as well work on the electrodes too. I'll connect up as best I can uh, the MMO to a piece of this titanium. That looks pretty good to me. Uh, what I've done is just taken a small piece of the titanium, cut a little bit off, and then kind of like crimped over the MMO mesh. Uh, this is pretty solid um, and I'm pretty sure that will do nicely for our cell. Um, the surface area of the MMO isn't particularly great. I mean, we've only got, um, what is that, five by two centimeters there, but we won't be running the cell at very high currents. I have a bigger MMO mesh, but I'm saving that for a chlorate cell for a future video. And after waiting for the silicon to dry for our diaphragm, we have what is hopefully a functional diaphragm for our cell. Uh, we have our electrode done and there's not really all that much left to do. We just need to set up the cell from this point on. Like really, that is pretty much done. All put together, um, we will have our anode in there like that or something. And we can put our glass funnel over the top just to collect all that chlorine gas. Okay, everything's set up. I have added the correct solutions into our vessel. We have the anode chamber here filled with a saturated solution of sodium chloride, and I've put a whole bunch of extra sodium chloride in there uh, just to make sure that it stays saturated all the time. I've put distilled water in the cathode chamber over there, and I have our electrodes ready. Grab those. Uh, this is the cathode. It's just a copper wire, a nice high surface area. That will just go nicely into the cathode chamber there and we have the anode uh, which is our MMO that will also just hang over the side here and then the last thing to do before we set everything up is to set up our chlorine collector which is basically just going to be this funnel and this tube uh, we're not going to be using the chlorine for anything so we'll just put that there and lead the chlorine into a solution of sodium hydroxide to scrub it I know it seems a little bit weird that we're using sodium hydroxide solution in the synthesis of sodium hydroxide, but really sodium hydroxide is just the easiest thing to use to scrub the chlorine gas. I'll just give you a quick close up of the device. Um, these batteries, by the way, aren't part of the experiment. They're just to hold the vessel steady. Uh, we'll start with the cathode chamber. You can see the cathode as before. Uh, you can see the diaphragm in the PVC pipe in there. And then the anode chamber, as I said before, I filled this with a whole bunch of salt uh, just to make sure that it stays saturated in sodium chloride. Uh, we have the gas collector straight over our MMO anode. Uh, sadly, we probably won't be able to see that perfectly. And now I've just hooked everything up, so everything should be up and running. I've switched it on, and we have a very small amount of current flowing. Of course, that current is going to remain low for quite some time. Uh, the distilled water in the cathode chamber isn't a good conductor, and we need to wait for some of the sodium ions to traverse through the diaphragm and form a little bit of sodium hydroxide uh, to increase that conductivity. I'm pretty confident that with the size of diaphragm that we've made uh, this time, we should be able to push around about an amp of current through the cell. While we wait a couple of hours uh, for the current to build up, uh, just wanted to talk about the last thing I've done, which is just put a little bit of cling wrap over the top of the cathode compartment here. So seeing as we'll have a positive pressure of hydrogen on the inside, I've punched just a few tiny holes. The hydrogen will slowly escape and no carbon dioxide will be in contact with the solution, hopefully. Here we are four hours into the cell run. Um, we haven't seen very much current build up over that time. I was expecting quite a bit more. Um, we're only at around about 35 milliamps flowing at this stage. Um, we're just at the stage now where if I get you up close to the MMO anode right now, you can see we are generating a small amount of chlorine. The hydrogen, of course, is also bubbling off the copper cathode, but the visibility of that is not so great through our cling wrap. 21 hours into running the cell and everything is going well. Um, the tubing, as we expected, is kind of degrading a bit in contact with the chlorine, but that's to be expected. Overnight, the current rose to 250 milliamps, um, which is currently uh, the current limit that I've set, but we'll turn that up to one amp in just a bit. 
Um, if we get a close up of the anode, you can see there's a whole bunch of chlorine being generated there, which is what we want. Forming sodium chloride and sodium hypochlorite or bleach, which is our yellow colouring there. You can also see um, the yellow colouring in the anode compartment there. Uh, that's due to the fact that because our diaphragm isn't cation selective, uh, some of the hydroxide ions that are generated in the cathode chamber will traverse over to the anode chamber and react with the chlorine coming off forming bleach in the anode chamber as well, which is the major source of inefficiency in our cell. Anyway, let's turn the current up to one amp as we want it. Um, you can watch the current rise on the multimeter down there. All right, we can't quite get an amp yet uh, at 12 volts, which is the maximum voltage I can put through the cell. But again, that should um, increase over time. At this current, we're getting excellent chlorine formation there. Yeah. And then also, if we take off that cling wrap for just one sec, you can see all that hydrogen being generated as well. Notice the color difference between our solutions as well. Uh, that means our diaphragm is doing a good job at keeping our solutions separate. We'll leave this running long enough, I think, to generate maybe 20 grams of sodium hydroxide. I think that'll be good for a first test. So at the expected one amp that we'll be running, we'll need to leave that going for around 50 hours at my predicted cell efficiency of 20%. And so we're at the end of the cell run. Um, nothing went wrong. I was expecting the tubing we were using for the chlorine to split or something like that, but it seems to have held up perfectly fine. Um, but all that's left to do is to turn off the cell, empty the anode and cathode compartments, and we'll see how much sodium hydroxide we've made. And there we are, that's the cell disassembled. Uh, we have the diaphragm, the analyte, we have our chlorine scrubber, our catholite, which is our sodium hydroxide, our electrodes, and our tubing. First of all, the diaphragm uh, we have here, it held up very well, or at least the clay pot part of it did, the bit that's actually um, performing as a diaphragm. The silicon is kind of looking ever so slightly damaged uh, just around the outside. This was the side that was in contact with the sodium hydroxide. Um, just maybe the very edges don't look particularly happy. The other side, which was exposed to um, the analyte, so the chloride solution, and then probably a bit of maybe chlorine, hypochlorite, and maybe even a little bit of chlorate as well. Um, you can see it's slightly damaged again, but really it's done better than expected, I think. Um, this would last many uses before it actually failed. Next, our electrodes. First off, uh, we have the cathode. Uh, this wasn't damaged at all, as you would expect. The anode, you can see here, um, the MMO did perfectly fine as well, generating chlorine at one amp. Um, there's a little bit of salt caked to the top of the electrode here, but that'll come off, I think. The titanium did fine as well. You can't even really tell that the electrode has been used at all, which highlights the effectiveness of the MMO and titanium. Here we have our gas scrubber, which we were using to uh, absorb all of the chlorine gas that was coming off our cell. Um, what this was doing was we had, as I said, a sodium hydroxide solution here that was absorbing that chlorine gas and forming bleach or sodium hypochlorite in solution. Uh, this is actually a pretty effective way of making concentrated bleach as the stuff that it generates is actually very pure if you run the reaction to completion. This was the analyte from the cell. Uh, so this is all the solution from the anode chamber. Initially, it was a relatively pure sodium chloride solution. Uh, but over time, uh, in this particular form of diaphragm electrolysis, what we allow to happen is the migration of hydroxide ions from the cathode compartment, where we're generating the sodium hydroxide, back into the anode compartment. And those hydroxide ions can react with the chlorine coming off the anode. So what we did end up generating a little bit of in the anode chamber is some sodium hypochlorite, as we were generating uh, in our gas scrubber. That's why you can see just a little bit of yellow coloration to this solution. And in fact, because we left the cell running for quite a while, I'd imagine that 
um, a large portion of the sodium hypochlorite we're generating in our anode compartment was oxidized by the anode itself into chlorate. So I'd imagine that uh, this analyte here is a mixture of sodium chloride, sodium hypochlorite and sodium chlorate. Now this production of hypochlorite and chlorates in the anode compartment is actually a major source of inefficiency for our cell. Industry gets around this problem by either utilizing the membrane process where they use an ion exchange membrane instead of a diaphragm. That will almost completely stop the transfer of hydroxide ions which will almost completely stop the generation of hypochlorite and chlorate. The other way industry gets around it is by using a slightly different kind of cell. Um, mainly what they do is say this side of the diaphragm is our anode chamber with our sodium chloride and this side is our cathode chamber with sodium hydroxide. What they do is apply pressure to the anode chamber to force solution through the diaphragm that way. You know, that stops the hydroxide ions from traversing that way but it also makes the hydroxide solution that you're generating um, impure because what they're essentially doing is uh, pushing the sodium chloride solution into the place where they're generating the sodium hydroxide so they end up generating a mixture of sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride and then what they do is just boil down their solution of sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride and crystallize them out separately. I'm not quite sure how they separate them properly but that's all the information I could find in my quick research. Anyway, the generation of hypochlorite and chlorate in the anode chamber is just something that um, any amateur chloralkali cells using a diaphragm process will just have to deal with. Finally, this is the sodium hydroxide that we generated. Again, I've got a little bit of cling wrap over the top uh, to stop it absorbing any carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, it's pretty much crystal clear, as you can see, which is a good sign. I did go ahead and titrate this. And what we found was that this solution of around about 650 milliliters contains about 15 or 16 grams of sodium hydroxide in it, which is not a great yield. We put enough current through the device to, at 100% efficiency, generate 100 or so grams of sodium hydroxide. So the process was overall 15% current efficient. Maybe it was a little bit more. I'm being particularly harsh with my calculations there, but either way, it's not really a great yield or a great efficiency. Um, it's not too bad considering the fact that in our last video, we determined that with the cell we built in that video, um, the highest efficiency we could achieve was around about 25%. But that's approximately this much sodium hydroxide, um, which isn't a trivial amount. That's pretty reasonable for two days of running the cell at a reasonably low current. And then finally, doing some calculations with the numbers, um, including the voltage that our cell ended up running one amp at, um, around about six or seven volts. We were generating um, around about 50 grams of sodium hydroxide per kilowatt hour, which at my electricity prices means that we were generating sodium hydroxide at a price of $5 per kilogram which is much cheaper than I get it at the hardware store. So it is profitable to do it like this if you have the equipment and everything. The only catch is it generates sodium hydroxide as a solution rather than as a solid. Um, if you wanted to boil this down and retrieve the solid sodium hydroxide, you'd need quite a lot more electricity. I was going to boil it down and retrieve some solid for you, but um, I thought better um, if we were to boil down sodium hydroxide solution, especially concentrated sodium hydroxide solution in glassware, it would attack it pretty badly. And I don't think my hot plate is even really good enough to do that anyway. Um, so the best we're gonna do is just show you that it's definitely sodium hydroxide by dissolving a little bit of aluminum foil. So what I've got here is just a little bit of our sodium hydroxide and as a final little test experiment to see that we do have sodium hydroxide we will dissolve this aluminium foil with it. You can see after a minute of waiting or so, it does start to dissolve our aluminium foil, generating hydrogen gas in the process. And with that, we see our sodium hydroxide generation was a success. So that's that. See you later.